Hello, contrarian capitalists. Hope you're doing well. I'm delighted to be joined today by Lobo Pigre, who is a speculator, analyst, and author of Independent Due Diligence Reports. I'd highly recommend you go and check out the website, independentspeculator.com. I'll put links to that into the show notes. Lobo, how are you? Peachy, you know, contrarian capitalist. That's exactly what I am. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on board. And I just wanted to start with silver because that seems to be the hot topic at the moment and you recently recorded a different podcast and, and wrote an article about um being not wanting to be considered blind bullish on silver so i wondered if you could just elaborate on that for me please well if we'd been having this conversation a year ago we'd talk we'd be talking about how silver is so hated and such a contrarian opportunity uh, that tells you, you know, maybe everything you need to know. You know, the the opposite is when the market goes into hype mode. I think what sparked the 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 ex post that you're talking about was a story about the the military applications of silver and how this could be a huge offtake. And you know, my point is that that might be entirely true. I mean, the silver does go into all kinds of electronics, surely military electronics as well. But this isn't something that just happened yesterday. You know, it doesn't explain why silver just went like that. Uh, and there's no reason to expect it to, to make silver go like that more tomorrow. It's more or less of a of an because it's military, it's an unknown variable, but it's the sort of thing that's not likely to change overnight. And so, but it makes for really exciting headlines. Oh, the military secret use of silver, and oh, it's gonna make silver go to the moon. Well, it might. Quite literally on a, on a on a military rocket, uh, but that may not help us as investors. So not to beat that to death, but I, that's maybe a good place to start. As a contrarian, and the herd starts running with you, you have to start wondering about that. And this has been much the subject of discussion on my X feed, not just about silver, but gold, which has been hitting nominally at least all time highs all year long. So that even the mainstream financial media is picking up on it and starting to mention it. And every time that happens, there's you know some knee-jerk reaction on X. Oh, it's the top sell. So, well, of course, if you had actually done that, you know, it's one thing to snark on X and, and you know tongue in cheek and say something like that. It's another thing to actually do it. And if anybody had done that, every time, oh, CNBC mentioned gold sell, right? Uh, you know, there would have been a lot of lost profits uh, left on the table. The opportunity cost is real. So so this is an important question. How do you know when a market really is toppy and you need to be thinking about heading for the exits when it's all hype and no substance or when okay, you know, the media phase is picking up and it's you know we're going into the next big leg up. There's still more uh more bull market to go. And the answer is nobody knows for sure. But my sense from having been in this space for a couple decades and remembering what it was like in the 1970s in the great bull market of the 1970s i'm not at that old i wasn't a you know a broker back then or a trader i was a kid mowing lawns and babysitting and i put my money my savings my earnings into silver i bought silver dollars morgan dollars and things like that with my lawnmower money so i did participate and but but that's just the point like your lawnmower kid was talking about this silver dollars and stuff. That's not happening now. We're nowhere near that level of mania. So, you know, uh, past is prologue, that sort of thing. History may rhyme, but doesn't necessarily repeat. So I'm, I'm not making some promise about a moonshot here. I'm saying though, that even though we're looking at nominal all-time highs in gold, 12-year highs in silver, I do see more upside in both. Um, the you can't really say they're dirt cheap though even if we adjust for cpi inflation i'm sorry i'm getting kind of long-winded here but let me finish this thought if we adjust for cpi inflation silver at 35 is uh something like 860 something or other 1980 dollars so not like four or five dollar lows so we can't say it's dirt cheap but it's nowhere near you know 50 dollars previous highs even nominally so where do we go from here uh, let me pull out my crystal ball and I'll tell you, oh, uh, I think I think some correction and consolidation is normal after, you know, hockey stick moves such as we've seen. But as a fundamentalist, I do think that 
uh, we are a long way from the top in either silver or gold. Thank you for clarifying that because part of, you know, these podcasts and, you know, speaking to people is to try and explain more the fundamentals because even I've seen a lot of dysphoria out there and, you know, as you pointed out, mainstream media headlines, you know, we could do this, we could do that. And, you know, this happens and, you know, the last, any form of, you know, gold bull market or silver market years ago, I'll hold my hands up. I wasn't in this space. I wasn't really paying attention to it. So this is this is all new to me. And I think that, you know, taking the hype out of everything and going, right, this is where we're at. These are what the fundamentals are. This is why this is potentially going to happen. I think it's crucial. So you know, thank you for towing that line because that's really what we're here for. All right. Well, let me just add with the fundamentals, there's good news and bad news here. I do think the fundamentals are are vitally important. I'm not a technical analyst or a technical trader. There are, you know, totally asset agnostic technical traders out there that will jump on whatever has momentum. And that can work. You know, a, a flavor of the day, as we call it, is actually very rarely a day. They often run for a year or so. I mean, look how long the, the AI craze has been a flavor of the day uh, or, or pick another flavor of the day before that. So... Um, you know, there is space for that, but that's just not my style. And, and I've never been able to find a methodology that makes me comfortable that I'm not going to be the last one to buy high and hope to sell higher. So I focus on buying low and selling high. And that's why I'm a fundamentalist. And I look at the fundamentals. And the, the simplest thing I can do is just say, if you look at a long-term chart of the value of the dollar, you know, even as understated by the CPI, if you use CPI, I understand that's a it's a nonsense number. You can't trust the government to be honest about this. I get all that. But if you use that number, people can't say, oh, you're making it up or you're a conspiracy theorist or whatever. You're using the government's own number. Um, and if you look at that, you know, the purchasing power of the dollar is this, you know, decline over the years. And, an ex you know, um, and if you look at the even just the nominal price of gold, it's an increase over the years. Okay, a lot of volatility, big ups and downs. But if you if you plot these two since 1971, when Richard Nixon severed the relationship of the dollar and gold, it's a giant X. Right? Kind of curvy, but it's a giant X over 70 years, which is actually not just the most recent 70 years, that is the entire time that the that gold has been separated from the dollar. So it's the, the entire time there's actually been a market since gold was money, you know, before, I mean, it was, it's still money, but since it was in circulation as money. So this is the entire relevant time frame. It's a giant X. As a fundamentals, that's all I need to know. Like, like in, in long term, that's really all anybody needs to know. That said, it doesn't tell me what to buy this week. It doesn't tell me what's, you know, likely to go up or down in the next year. My own investment time frame, because I'm a public figure, I have you know, 35,000 very best friends looking over my shoulder. What, you know, what am I buying today? Right. Um, I need to be careful and I can't just say, oh yeah, well, don't worry about it. In 10 years, we'll all be fine. You know, that, that doesn't work. Um, so here's the takeaway. I am a fundamentalist, not a technician. I look at the big picture, try to understand what's going on. But then in terms of my investment decision-making now, I remember the ever so wise words of Rick Rule. Uh, don't confuse the inevitable with the imminent, right? The fundamental understanding will tell you what's inevitable. Debasement of currencies, all that stuff. Yes, it's inevitable that real assets will appreciate when fiat goes you know, down the circular drain. Doesn't make it imminent. As the dollar milkshake guy, Brent Johnson, my fellow Puerto Rican will explain, right? You know, Just because the BRICS countries are working their way out of the dollar hegemony doesn't mean that tomorrow, right? Gold's going to the moon. So the way I resolve this is I, I, I have a fundamental case and understanding, and then I look at four trends that are actually happening now. Not inevitable, not imminent, but actually in motion now. And one of those is and has been that gold has been breaking out from a trading range uh, since 2020, really. And there's a lot of different ways we can go with that. The, the silver one is more complicated because it does have an industrial aspect. And that is a concern to me in the face of what is clearly a deepening global recession, in my view. 
And I know silver bulls don't like hearing me say that, and they call me Darth Silver and all these things, but but life is complicated often. You, you can't just wish it to be simple. But but the, the key point is understand the fundamentals. And then in my view, look at what's actually happening now. And is this an investable trend? Is, is it late? Is it early? Is this something that has reason for me to believe this has legs and there's room for me to profit here? That's how I work. And that's an incredibly smart way to work because we sometimes we don't necessarily know what around the corner. I mean, I've seen, like, like yourself, I've seen so much information out there about what is potentially happening. And, and, and you know, what I've come to believe, whether it's right or wrong, I mean, I don't know until it happens, is that with what's going on in the world at the moment and fundamentals, that things should, in theory, keep ticking up, you know, little by little. Then what's possible is if we do get this global recession, and, and as you've highlighted there, there are a lot of economic indicators that suggest things aren't, you know, all good at the Rose Garden. The rug can get pulled out, so things will, you know, global li liquidity crisis, you know, things you know, drop down, and then it could potentially, I don't want to say off to the moon because that's hyperbole, but then it, it could reverse pick up again and, you know, go from there. That's what, that's what I read, and that's what my understanding is. I don't know if that's a sentiment you would agree with or anything you want to add to on that at all, Lobo? Sure. Well, you know, it, here in the United States, it's really striking to see team soft landing sort of morphing back into team no landing again. And it, it's all this talk on the mainstream financial media about how great the economy is. But it's just not true. <laughs> you know, dear audience, if you find yourself scratching your head over this, you're not imagining things. It's not somehow sunny everywhere except for your rain cloud, you know, um, over your head. Uh, it's, you know, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but it's really striking how how harmonious the choir seems to be on how wonderful everything is. And it's really, as far as I can tell, predicated on one single data point the so-called blowout jobs report that the US reported. Like if you, if you look at the broader world, uh, you know, Europe, the headlines are pretty negative, you know, almost consistently negative. And with Germany, the troubles are happening in Germany, the, the industrial heartland of Europe, it's a, that's a big deal. In China, the, you know, the, the bulls will say, oh, well, you know, even 4% growth out of China would be much better than the West is doing. That's not the point. It's not a contest of, you know, comparing your number to the West. The point is that from a Chinese perspective, that's terrible. And it's it's a political problem there. It's a policy problem there. And they are struggling. Um, and other parts of the world as well. You know, the, the exceptionalism in the United States is, you know, like I say, I think it's at, at best a very, very, very optimistic reading of selective data. I mean, even if we take that one labor print at face value, which I don't, but if we did, it would be one amongst a sea of red lights, even in the labor market since last July, the number of indicators for a weakening labor market, which has been the pillar of support for US exceptionalism is strong, it's there's widespread. So to put too much weight on this one, you know, supposedly encouraging print is, is just on its face, a huge mistake. But of course, there are lots of problems with that print. And, you know, I, we don't need to get too far down that rabbit hole. But let me just say September is a is a change season in the U.S. economy. And its uh, statistics are notorious for big revisions. And after we just saw almost a, a million jobs disappear in one <laughs> one fell swoop of revision in the U.S., you know, that's a significant risk factor for putting too much weight on this one thing. So. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I remember quite what we started with this, but what I'm saying is, you know, the, the, the data is out there, Sully, right? If you, if you want to be objective and pay attention to it, you know, don't, don't listen to just me. Just try not to have an agenda. Try to look at the plurality of data. Well, we just got leading economic indicators negative again. I mean, there, there is plenty of negative data that team soft landing is ignoring and team low landing is just, you know, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Yes. 
it's it's scary. It's even I was uh, looking at, although I'm based in, in the UK, I was looking at some US data and you see like mortgage applications are down and it, all sorts of the generic data yes, that's yes, important. That, and housing is big. Sorry, let me jump back in again because I kind of got US centric. I drifted off with the answer to your question, but but looking at it globally and you know, you and your audience, I presume is not just US based. It's important to understand that, you know, we in the hard money space, you know, gold bugs, if you will, but really mining and generally people into commodities tend to be more hard nosed about this. You look at the US a lot and it's not just because you're American centric, it's because commodities are quoted in dollars. And even if in your local market, you can trade them in other things, but the benchmarks are quoted in US dollars. And so what happens to the US dollar is very important to your commodities and your business. And for me, my speculations. So please understand, dear audience, that I'm, I'm not just, you know, an Americanophile and everything in America, rah, rah, rah. It's just, you know, this is the 800 pound gorilla that drives the, you know, the, the financial side of the market. And the other 800 pound gorilla, of course, is China, which, which drives sort of the demand for commodities writ large. Uh, but for gold in particular and silver as monetary metals, the fate of the US dollar and therefore you know, all these shenanigans with the U.S. economy and the reporting on it are very important. Yes, very, very true. And I do think that people, again, that's part of the reason of doing these podcasts and, and recording this information is to get that information out there, but also to alert people to what's going on because what's being reported, and you know, the, this is probably a global thing, what's being reported is not necessarily a fair representation of what's happening and there might be some underlying reasons you know i always say why do you think all these banks uh, are buying a lot of gold that there's going to be a very good reason why they're doing that so it's important to look at these trends and, and figure out what's going on and more importantly why it's happening as well if i can throw a quick trick in there helpful tip for the audience you know so if, if everybody's got an agenda if we're a wash in bullshit you know, how, how, you know, how do you proceed? What do you do? It's very important not just to listen to only your favorite podcasts or the people who agree with you because you can get into the echo chamber that way. And that is dangerous to you as an investor. If everybody is saying what you want to hear, you know, they may be right. But, you know, if there's something wrong or overlooked, you're not going to hear it. Just listening to people that agree with you. So what I do is in the U.S., for example, I'll as much as I dislike both of them, I'll watch Fox and CNN. Because they they have such polar opposite political agendas, you know. If if one says Trump went to Pennsylvania and fell on his face, and the other one says Trump went to Pennsylvania and triumphed, I can tune out the fell on his face and the triumphed, and and be fairly certain that Trump went to Pennsylvania, right? If they both agree with that, that's probably true. And as I recall back in the day in France, you know, Le Monde and Le Figaro were similarly opposite publications. There's, so there's usually some way to triangulate by listening to opposing views and, and finding the facts that every side agrees to and stipulates, because those are the guys that they'll be trying to undermine each other on. And internationally, that works too. People criticize me sometimes on X for posting stories from the BBC because they see the BBC as a quasi statal you, know, you know, very biased organization. And I'm like, yeah, but their bias is British. So when the Brits cover something in the U.S., they don't have the agenda that a U.S. media outlet would. And, you know, the same going in the other direction. So internationally, you can triangulate in this way, too. And I do think as a due diligence tool, this is an important thing to keep in mind because, you know, you, you can't go out and interview every congressperson yourself, you know, even if you would believe anything they said, never mind that. But, you know, right, you know, you have to rely on third party information even as unreliable it is as it is. So this tip, if you will, is, is how I try to, you know, sort out, you know, sift out the grains of truth from the, you know, vast sandboxes of lies out there. Just going back to Germany, because you mentioned Germany uh, a few minutes ago, and this is um, a, a topic that, you know, we could probably go ad nauseum uh, about. It is uh, some form of nuclear renaissance. Now, I appreciate for your listeners that are listening to this, uh, you know, uh, my listeners that are listening to this, people are going to be quite au fait with nuclear and they're probably going to be screaming and saying, nuclear is the answer, we know, you know all, all this sort of stuff. But mainstream media seems to have ignored it in, 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 in part until recently. 
And I'm not just basing this on, you know, articles that you and I have probably read, but it does seem to me that uranium nuclear people or, or the general public seem to be waking up to the idea that actually nuclear might be one of the best answers in order to meet this and net zero criteria for want of a, a better word. Uh, what are your thoughts or observations on that? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I guess so you and I and our audiences were already here, so I don't need to beat them up to head with the fundamentals. I think maybe the most useful thing I can say right now is it's really interesting to me that before the recent spate of media attention, uranium spot was already carving out a bottom. It had gotten way ahead of long-term contract, which, you know, within the business, everybody knows that's the more important price spot, or, you know, doesn't really matter to your business as a uranium miner or refiner or enricher or whatever, you know, it's the long-term contract prices that really matter. Um, but, you know, there's, there's not a lot of transparency on it. Let me rephrase that. There is very little transparency on that. Uh, you know, what data you get is usually after the fact. And so people have to rely on spot and spot does move share prices. So if I was a miner in the business, you know, I'd probably ignore spot you know, a lot as much as I could. But as a speculator buying stocks, then yes, I have to care about spot. So here's where I'm going with this. Spot was already carving out a bottom. It got ahead of long-term contract. It came back and hey, lo and behold, where did, where did the decline stop? Pretty much when it bumped into long-term contract. And now it seems to be curving up again, which makes sense because long-term contracts trend is still like this. So if that one got ahead, it's coming down. This one's going like this. The you know spot meets the important you know, and it starts turning up. It all makes perfect sense to me. This makes me very very bullish. If you were worried about the correction, which by the way I got a lot of hate for when uranium was over a hundred dollars a pound, me saying hey, you know it's gone like a hockey stick. A bit of a correction is is if not uh, the most likely outlook, at least something you want to prepare for the possibility of, right? So. I'm not a permable. Uh, keep that in mind, because if I'm going to say something bullish, I don't want you to just write us off. Oh, he's just another uranium bug. No, I I was one of the people out there beating the drum on a probable correction. If not, and and I was right. And now everything that I see in the same space tells me that the bottom's probably in, probably, but probably in. I'm very very bullish going forward. Now, here's the interesting thing: the the real answer to your question is this media attention that we've gotten hasn't really done anything for spot at all. It was already kind of going like this. There's been no change in that trajectory. It hasn't gone like that. You know, it's, it's going where it was. It's the stocks that have suddenly gone like up double digits in a day. Uh, so that's really interesting to me. Um, it is not necessarily a red flag, but there is danger here. If, uh, if, if stocks go vertical like that based on media hype, Obviously, it seems to me, I can't prove this, you know, Mr. Market isn't one person that you can say, hey, why did you do this? Mr. Mm -hmm. Market, millions of participants with different reasons and objectives. But it seems clear to me that this AI hype has made uranium, which by the way, we wrote an article about that, that uranium was an AI play before Microsoft and Google and Amazon jumped in on this bandwagon. But the fact that these these Big market darlings have jumped on the nuclear bandwagon. And I think most tellingly of all, it's interesting this was a case where a single headline could make such a difference. The Microsoft deal to bring Three Mile Island back online. You know, anybody who's studied it knows that Three Mile Island was a nothing burger. You know, after decades, there's still no evidence that a single person was hurt by that incident. Was there an incident? Yes. You know, was there an act? Did something go wrong? Yes. But the backup systems and the engineering, and because nuclear engineers are aware of how critically important it is to do things right, nobody got hurt. Um, is it the same for Fukushima, right? It, you know, there was a bad thing happened there, but it was the tsunami that killed the people, not the nuclear power plant. And the engineers, they saw there was an emergency. They saw that there was a design flaw, putting those pumps down where the, where the high waters could inundate them. And they took action. And guess what? There's really been no nuclear incident there, uh, not in terms of hurting people. So the only, in 70 years of track record, the only real problem we've had is Chernobyl in terms of you know radiation leakage and hurting people. And that was arguably more due to 
Soviet stupidity than in nuclear engineering. But anyway, I'm getting off the side point. I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying that this kind of hype and excitement for nuclear energy now has moved the uranium stocks because clearly it's brought a lot of attention to people who are not steeped in the industry. They don't really understand it necessarily. They just like, oh my gosh, you know, Microsoft is here, and and the my the the rail the off ramp that I got sidetracked on was Three Mile Island, but that's really important. I mean, that really it's one thing for for you know Google to say, oh yeah, we're going to use nuclear energy in the future. It's another thing for you know Microsoft to say we're going to recommission Three Mile Island or we're going to pay to help with that because that's just such a such an iconic historical moment. It's it's just a wake up call that it's hard for people to ignore. It's the sort of thing that gets people's attention. So where am I going with this? It does make me a little bit nervous to see the stocks run up and the in the underlying commodity not anytime that happens, there is a, there's a discrepancy between value and price, and that's risky. And you never know if these Johnny come latelys had just heard about Microsoft and Three Mile Island, they're just excited. If there's some negative scare, you know, something happens in Ukraine around the nuclear power plant, those same people could just sell tomorrow. So, you know, that sort of thing makes me nervous. I wouldn't chase anything that's just hit a 52 week high. There's some of those stocks have hit all time highs. There's one large company and I, I'm sure you know, I don't need to name it. One large player in this space that went from a 52 week low in September to a 52 week high this week. Right. In, in, in just one month because of this, this not because the price of uranium changed, not because new long term contracts came in higher, you know, spot, you know, a few cents higher, but, you know, no, nothing big, but really because of the AI hype spilling over in, into the nuclear space, you know, that brings risk. Hear me what I'm saying, folks. I'm not making a bearish case on uranium. I'm very bullish. I'm looking to add more, but I would not chase anything at a 52-week high because, you know, Johnny-come-latelys are piling in. They could leave tomorrow. But here's the good news is, let's say they do. You know, it, we're, we're on a trend that's like this. It spikes, it gets ahead of itself, and then those people leave. It comes back to the trend. So I think you know, um, we're looking at a multi-year bear, uh, no, sorry, bull market for uranium. I'm very, very bullish. I'm just unwilling to chase anything that's gone vertical. I'll, you know, the markets fluctuate. This will fluctuate. There will be buying opportunities. Uh, fortunately, I'm long already. So if if you're, you know, as you've described our audiences, you know, you're, you're okay. You've already got uranium stocks. You don't need to give in to FOMO. If I was completely new to the space right now, I would absolutely resist the FOMO. I would wait for a correction. Very practical and very poignant uh, there, and I think that I think that's good because I know there's been a, you know I know there's been a lot of hype in a lot of different markets recently, and it is very challenging I think for a lot of people to look at the practicalities of something and then try and remove their emotions from it, like you said, uh, you know, from, to go from a 52-week low in September. A 52 week high in October is, mm, yeah, nuts. Uh, that'd be very. I mean, it's great for those who are along, but mm. for anybody looking to buy, you know, that's that's a red flag. It's it's where it's quite easy to get your fingers burned, to say the least. I'm just smiling. Just not to say it can't go higher, but you know, mm. this is all a game of odds, right? The I again, we talked about this before with the flavor of the day thing. And by the way, I don't see any signs that the AI flavor of the day is going to just die tomorrow. But it's not brand new. Like suppose that, you know, we get more quarterly reports from some of these big AI companies or AI plays and they disappoint. Or the companies that are that are saying they're going to use AI, you know, everybody and their cousin came out over the last year saying, oh yeah, we're going to sell more hamburgers with AI. Oh, we're going to build more airplanes with AI. Oh, we're going to have AI tire shoelaces or, you know, whatever it was, right? And every stock that says AI, the stock went up, right? You know, it could happen next week that investors say, you know, my shoelaces still don't tie themselves. And 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 this, this craze could then fade. And then to the degree that uranium is getting a tailwind from the AI craze, that could fade. You know, I, but I don't know which way that's going to go. All I'm saying is if that does happen, then that gets us back to the trend, the, the fundamental trend, which I think is very bullish. 
yeah, and I agree. And I, what I would add to that, and I was going to say, you might see me smiling. So I actually made a note about Uranium being an AI play, but you beat me to it. So I, I was laughing at my notes there. Um, but I'd also add to, to nuclear or uranium by saying that I, I take a step back and I look at you know, what's, what's going on in and around you know, Western Europe. And we have this march towards net zero. I'm not going to get on my political high horse about that. But I look at it and I, I look at it and go, right, OK, wind farms, solar farms, whatever they might be, too intermittent for my liking. If you're going to have, and I think Bloomberg covered this when he appeared recently, you can have good base load energy and you want to get away from coal or uh, you know gas uh, etc nuclear is one of those solutions so i look at that and it's it's the solution and i'm not dissing everything else but think about it hmm. the the natural gas i mean just think of the name natural gas oh that must be good it's natural <laughs> right but it's still carbon Right? And if it's clean natural gas with low sulfur, you know, fine. It's, you know, I'm not against it. But but if you're one of these people who thinks you need to stop carbon now, you know, it's really something that today carbon is more hated than uranium. You know, that's really a sea change. But anyway, if that's your mindset, you know, natural gas is not a good transition energy. You, at, at best, it is a transition energy, but it's one you want to get rid of as soon as possible. Whereas nuclear is not emitting. So, I mean, it. Here, here's here's one thing. Like, let's say the AI hype fades and goes away tomorrow, and the tailwind we just saw last week from that goes away. We're back to trend. I think we're okay. Um, but if that happens, there's still a um, a lesson to take from this, which I think is very important. It is, you know, the the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons. Why do they choose nuclear? They didn't announce giant new wind farms. They didn't announce giant new solar arrays. They're not going to pave Arizona to power their new data centers with, with solar panels, right? That's one separate irony is, you know, we're going to pave the planet to save the planet with, with solar panels, but never mind. But, but think about what they're saying. These are, you know, these are not environmental groups. You know, they may talk politically correct stuff because they're big corporations and they have to play to the audience. But when it came down to an engineering choice, how are we going to power these giant new data centers and the enormous amount of energy they're going to need? It wasn't windmills. It wasn't solar. It wasn't any, it was nuclear because that's where you get, I mean, even hydropower, even a huge dam that that's, you know, it's 24, seven, 365, unless you get a drought, right? If you have an unusual drought or a series of dry years, and your water levels get dangerously low, even a huge hydropower dam can let you down. That doesn't happen with nuclear. So if you're looking at needing as much electricity as the entire country of Japan uses, <laughs> I mean, the, the engineering really only leaves you with one choice if you're not gonna go with fossil fuels or, or carbon-based fuels. So I, I think this is an important lesson. You know, hear what I'm saying, I'm not bearish here, but if the AI hype fades away, the lesson that the engineers from these biggest, you know, they, if, if, if you needed any budget to find out what's the best solution, these guys had it, right? The sky's the limit. And they chose nuclear. I think that tells us in the world a, a very important lesson. And I think that's a, that's a one-way street. That lesson doesn't get unlearned. It may take a while to sink in, but the, but the reality of what just happened is very important for the nuclear industry. Look, I couldn't have put that better myself. I completely concur with everything you've just said. Uh, one, this might be a devil's advocate question, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, why then, with the things that we're discussing, and uh, again, appreciate we're talking about Behemoth with you know Google, Microsoft, etc. Why do you think there is not much or a better public awareness that nuclear is the answer? Well, hey, I think it's coming. I mean, again, <laughs> in the place where the Fukushima accident actually happened, they can't restart their nuclear plants fast enough. I mean, they 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 got the word, you know, at some point people look at their electric bills and ideology gives way to reality, right? At, at the end of the day, physics always wins. So if Japan can make an about face on this, and, and this Three Mile Island thing is like that in the United States. 
right? So, so I really do think this is coming, but, but make no mistake, this was a massively demonized, uh, you know, not just the, you know, the whole idea, the whole sector. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an investigative reporter who was there on the ground in the 1970s. So I can't tell you, I know for a personal fact, but I have read credible reports that it was oil money that funded a lot of the hysteria and hate and propaganda against nuclear back in the day. Cause you know, they could see the writing on the wall and, and, you know, they were activists in that period. So this is something that has not just been hated and not just been misunderstood. It has been subject to an active campaign of disinformation and deliberate fear mongering and hate spreading for decades, decades and decades. You know, that doesn't go away in a, in a day or, or in a year. That will take time. But you know, I'm not one for crystal ball predictions. Hmm. But I, I would think that as the trends are going, it's not inevitable, certainly not imminent. But I can see the day where Germany does an about face as well just because at the end of the day, reality matters. I sincerely hope that is the case. And I say similar here uh, in, in the UK as well with, I think we've got some of the highest, if not the highest electricity prices in the world. And I do think people are starting very slowly, starting to put two and two together. They're starting to go, well, hang on a minute. Why is this happening? Yeah. X, Y, Z. It's a very slow well, process. Did you, did you, on your side of the pond there, did you see the stories? I think it was, might have been last year. Uh, the whiter my hair gets, the, the more the months blur together. But not terribly recently. But when Finland turned on their big new nuclear power plant, they had so much more electricity. They, 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 there were days where they had negative prices. It was like natural gas in Texas. You know, sometimes you just have too much of it. <laughs> So I know there in the UK, you've got a nuclear power plant that's like 10 times over budget or whatever, you know, this huge blowout and so on. But you know what, once that's done and it's behind you, the CapEx is sunk, that thing runs for decades and decades and decades with, you know, and whether you care about non-carbon emitting or not, you know, the cost of the nuclear fuel there is just de minimis compared to almost any other source. So, you know, that's behind you. And and people who say, oh, well, your nuclear is too expensive. Well, the SMRs are the answer to that objection. So I, I do think the tide is changing. The world is changing. And importantly, you know, the propaganda is changing. If, if the Greta Thunbergs of the world are saying, you know what, Germany shouldn't have shut down their nuclear power plants, that's that's a sea change as well, right? And, and you have more and more environmentalists, not just, you know, evil contrarian capitalists like me and you, but you have environmentalists saying, yeah, we need nuclear as part of the solution. Yeah, we don't like it, but we need it. So we need to go there. You know, that just, just they're willing to say, to pinch their nose and say, okay, we'll include nuclear as part of the solution. That was, it was a non-starter just five or 10 years ago. And now it's on the table as an option. That is a huge change. Yeah. I remember. Oh, sorry. By the way, you know, this is a good example for what we were talking about earlier, methodology wise. You know, we're all, all this stuff about nuclear, we've just been going back and forth on it's the fundamentals. You know, it, you know but imminent doesn't tell me, you know, uh, sorry, inevitable doesn't tell me what's imminent. Imminent doesn't necessarily tell me that, you know, it's, it's really good. Like we make that mistake. We, we're so convinced of the inevitable, we think it's imminent when it's not. This is something that's not just inevitable, it's not just imminent, it is happening now. Right? The restarts in Japan are happening now. The about face in the United States is happening now. The about face in the environmental camp is not a one bore, but it is starting to visibly happening now. These, this is what I mean when you look for a trend. Mm -hmm. right? When I say happening now, I don't just mean today. I'm not a day trader. I mean, there's a trend in motion here that has an investable length of time for me to get paid. And here's one more thing. Uranium Uber Bulls don't like it when I say this, but we actually don't need higher uranium prices to make money in this space. The better companies, the better projects, they all make money at substantially lower prices than we have in uranium right now. The, the average incentive price is more or less maybe where we are now, but the better companies and projects work at even lower prices. So we don't even need uranium to go up. We just need there to be not another Chernobyl, and we should make money in this space if we pick, if we choose wisely in this space. Off to uh 
have to call you Darth Uranium as well as uh, Darth Hill with a uh, <laughs> low <boat. laughs> No, I think, I, again, I appreciate you covering that aspect again, because as we said at the start, what's very important is to, again, look at the fundamentals, take the hype out of it and say, this is what's going on. This is some, some of the possibilities. So I appreciate that. Um, we, we've covered briefly cover gold we've covered silver we've just spoken about nuclear were there any other hot topic or hot commodities that you would like to talk about before we wrap up i'll probably get more hate saying this but i'm i am bullish on silver but i, I have to stress that you know it has just pulled a hockey stick it does still have industrial drivers if i'm right about you know this delusion of american exceptionalism coming apart uh, I think silver is at more risk than gold in the very nearest term. Like I'm very bullish on both, even midterm, not just long term. Um, but I think gold is on a more solid footing, despite nominal all time highs for the very nearest term. Next year, uh, you know, maybe silver outperforms gold. We'll see, because because you know, by the time the money helicopters really fly, then silver gets the, you know, the monetary metal push plus it gets the. It, the investment side from all that free money going into the industry side. So uh, on the other side of the recession, I like silver as more of a win-win metal. The other thing to focus on right now is if if you're not with me on the hard landing becoming undeniable, whatever, we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. But if you think that team soft landing to no landing is right, then copper and oil are buys right now. That's not me. I am not there. I am not buying copper and oil stocks right now. I do think things will get worse. I do think I'm likely to see lower prices. And so I'm holding for that. But as soon as I am sure that either I've, I've made a mistake and there is no hard landing, or I'm right, the hard landing makes itself known and even more easy money goes out, you know, bigger Fed pivot, if you will, more money from Washington and, and you know, uh, Brussels and other capitals. Um, then that's very bullish for both copper and oil. Other things I need to look at the market dynamics at the time, but I, I think copper and oil both those are those are instant. The moment I'm confident that the worst of the recession, one way or the other, is behind us, then those immediately go on my shopping list. Which brings me to one question that's just sprung to mind because this this podcast is out. I think about a week before the US presidential election. Now, of course, there could be big ramifications from that. But depending on who gets in, their policies are going to be wildly different. So are you also, with regards to copper and oil, for example, especially, I would imagine, oil, does the result of the US presidential election then have an impact in or a potential impact in your analysis of those commodities? Or is the story pretty much still likely to get a drop off and then back up again. What, what are your thoughts? Well, the likely drop-off has nothing to do with the election. So the answer to your question is none whatsoever. Okay. Th there is a lot of chatter in the press that one of the candidates' proposals is, are more inflationary than the other. But even, you know, it's again, one of these things, look, the left and the right, they both agree that both candidates' proposals are inflationary. So if one candidate's proposals are more inflationary than the other, that's something that's maybe inevitable but not imminent, like it will take years for that to play out. In my investment time frame, which is plus or minus two years, one to two years, it makes no difference whatsoever. And I'm not saying there's no difference between the candidates. Clearly on social issues, there are big differences. Um, and by the way, if you don't like either of them, and, and the, you know, I, I'm usually not political, I'm happily in Puerto Rico and I can't vote for president anyway, but if I was of a mind to register a protest vote, don't forget that there is a libertarian candidate out there. And so if you can't stand either one of the left or the right party uh, candidates, you don't have to vote for the lesser of two evils. And if anything, it would be important to send a message to both parties this year to see a third party do unusually well. I think that might be a wake-up call that would do the whole system good. Anyway, sorry, didn't mean to get political. The answer to the question is no difference whatsoever. Both of them are inflationary, you know, and if if Harris is more hostile to oil, that might make a difference to U.S. oil producers, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't change the, the outlook for the whole commodity as a globally fungible commodity. Same for copper. Um, both of them are, are, I think, 
essentially bullish for both. And I think the recession, if I'm right about that, is baked in the cake already. The election won't make any difference. Fair enough. Well, thank you for that analysis. Uh, I've got here independentspeculator.com. Also, for people who want to follow you on X, people that might not be familiar with your work already, due diligence guy or x.com forward slash due diligence guy. I'll put links to all of them in the Substack post and on YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, any final words of wisdom? Uh, any words of encouragement for, for the listeners? Yeah, usually this is where people stop listening because I'm going to hype my products. You know, you know where to find me. Let me just say that we are, with this election issue, coming into the time of maximum craziness, maps, maximum hype. Uh, please remember to be especially suspicious of people you agree with, because those are the guys who can slip the dagger in. The ones you disagree with, you're on your guard, your armor's up, you're more safe from them because you, you're, you're defending yourself. So don't fall to the echo chamber, try to be objective. Um, and I'm speaking here both as a speculator, this is essential for speculation to be objective and not drink the Kool-Aid, but as a human being too. You know, uh, if you're not with me, you're against me, rah, 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 for I aside. You know, it feels good at the pep rally, but these things can lead to ugly things in the real world. So please try to be objective. At the end of the day, reality always matters. Again, thank you. Uh, all I can do is say thank you for your time. Thank you for your um, yeah, input. I think it's a very good note to leave on. Uh, I'll put everything into the show notes and hopefully touch base again in 2025 and see what the lay of the land is in. We'll see how my crystal ball did. Thank you.